seen with Hurricane Katrina that even in America, you cannot go on deferring the realization of how serious this is. Environmentalists in that part of America, in Louisiana, Mississippi, had been saying for 10, 15 years, if you go on disregarding these issues, you go on ignoring what will happen as the temperature of the oceans warms up, you will pay a very heavy price. Now, I'm sorry to come down to a bit of old-fashioned doom and gloom, but I have to say to people who are worried about some quite small-scale issues, you better wake up and sniff out what's happening here, because it's going to be a great deal worse than many of the things you're currently worried about. One of the really uh, attractive things about wind energy is, of course, it doesn't depend upon fuel supplies. Uh, once you've built it, the energy is free from the wind. Uh, that's a valuable asset to have, particularly when you have got a lot of uncertainty in fossil fuel prices. You've then got the environmental benefits as well. Um, this is the biggest non-emitting power source uh, of, of all the new entrants, if you like, the new technologies in power generation. Uh, and in a world where you know we've done all we can to scrub about other pollutants we've still got a big problem with climate change that makes it a very attractive option so you know there's, there's there's a lot going for wind energy the way the commission looks at this now in terms of the opportunities for the uk i hope we'll see lots of different sources of renewable energy coming on stream over the course of the next 10 years but to be quite honest when you look at some of the cost issues, you look at availability issues, you look at some of the engineering challenges, it is wind power that we need to maximize as fast as we possibly can in the shortest period of time. Onshore as well as offshore, I'm not one of those who thinks that we should shove the whole thing offshore and forget about the onshore industry. I think we need both really successfully pushing these technologies to the maximum. It's a well-known fact in the office that I was totally opposed to wind farms. Um, Norfolk is a very level, flat um, county, known as the county of the big skies. And my opinion was that to put a turbine 100 metres tall when the blade was upright in the Norfolk landscape would be totally unacceptable. I've got to admit, I'd never actually seen a turbine in life. I'd seen photographs, but never a real one. But I was convinced that the process would be wrong. It would be just totally alien. It looked like something at War of the Worlds. I later um, read the environmental impact assessment, of course, once the application was submitted, and I started to realise that there were other reasons to look at wind energy, reduction of pollution, for instance. I then watched some of the early stages of this Swaffham turbine being built, and instead of seeing uh, the tripod from all the worlds going up, I saw a very graceful structure. And when completed, it did not detract from the landscape and it did not, did not detract from the Swaffham conservation area. It is quite an attractive structure. Well, it's not possible to put wind energy developments anywhere where a developer might like. The first step in the development process is really site selection. And what tends to happen in the process is that sites that have special qualities are avoided. So, for example, if we're considering the effects on landscape, people will try and avoid sites that are designated at the national level, such as areas of outstanding natural beauty in England and Wales and national scenic areas in Scotland. People should go and look at them. People should uh, take the opportunity when a developer offers a, a site visit to go and see them, to go and hear them, to go and look at them and to, um, to judge for themselves what the turbines look in reality and how they are perceived from the landscape. Clearly at the present time there are government policies and guidelines into the amount of renewable energy we're going to have to produce. But at the present time they do not override local considerations. People should be reassured that the planning process screens all these applications rigorously. They can be assured that we will not just allow any turbine to go up in any location because clearly not every site is acceptable for a wind turbine. And we'll make sure they will go in the right place at the right time. Most of the people who come to the Ecotech Centre come with some fairly strong opinions. A lot of them anti they go away having changed those opinions and we get a lot of feedback on our feedback uh, that says we really hadn't realized how nice they were how comfortable you can be with them uh, that they don't uh, threaten uh, that, that they are quite beautiful and they blend well into the environment
The reliability of wind is often mentioned in relation to wind power. And to start asking or answering that question, you've really got to look at what the characteristics of the UK wind resource are. If we're talking about a single site, a single wind power development, then that development will generate electricity for around 80 to 85% of the time. So there is a small amount of time when the turbines are idle, no electricity is being generated. But this is only one location, and this doesn't reflect what's happening around the country. For the UK, wind power is developed in a range of locations, and it's extremely unlikely that you will find no wind at all of those locations at the same time. There are other aspects to the question as well. Not only does wind power vary, but electricity demand varies as well. And so we need to look at the relationship between electricity demand and the availability of wind power. And what we find is that on average, wind power provides about two and a half times more electricity when demand is high compared to times when demand is very low. And this matches the seasonal patterns. Wind power provides more electricity in winter and the UK has a substantially higher electricity demand in winter. It's true that the power from a, from a uh, wind farm is not continuous, but it's also true that it's quite easy to forecast and there are now quite a lot of activities of, uh, afoot developing forecasting techniques for wind farms. I actually think the, the, the word intermittent is wrong in, in its application to wind. It should be variable. It isn't intermittent, because intermittent is a binary thing, it's either on or it's off. So actually conventional power is intermittent and renewable energy is variable. Although the, 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 the normal concept of a conventional power station run by, by gas or coal or nuclear is the public's image is it's, it's there all the time and it's working. In fact, it's there for a lot of the time, but occasionally, and not that occasionally, I mean, re relatively frequently, it goes. So if you lose the whole of size well B, uh, it's either there or it's not there. And it does go off, so does, the, so does the channel link. So conventional power is intermittent, renewable energy uh, is, is variable, and they both need to be looked at together in, in the same way, and that's possible to do statistically. And then I think if we do that, we get a very clear idea of the relative benefits of these two forms of generation. The target is that we'd like 10% of our electricity coming from renewables by 2010, that's the end of the decade, and uh, solar power will play a contribution and, and other forms of renewables, but most of that will be coming from the wind turbine. So that's the target, 10%. And then 10 years on, by 2020, we have what we call an aspiration that it could be as much as, uh, as 20%. So we're, we're very keen on renewables, and very committed to it as a government. There'll always be local issues about um, a particular planning application for a wind farm, but I think a growing number of people in Britain and indeed throughout the world are now worried about climate change, they're worried about global warming, they understand the arguments and they recognise that we need cleaner sources of energy and therefore more and more people I meet among the public are open-minded about wind farms and recognise actually that we do need more of them. Building any wind farm is going to affect the, the local area. You're going to lose habitat and, and maybe actually displace birds. Um, and we think it's very important that that happens on, on places which aren't very important for birds to start with. So it's a big country. We need a lot more wind farms, but there are a lot of places to put those wind farms where they won't have a big impact on birds. I think what's going on is that different issues are jostling for people's attention in different time frames. There are some short-term worries that people have which sometimes look bigger than the very large time frames that we're dealing with around issues like climate change. People have concerns about bird strikes and a this very small number of birds that might be affected by wind farms, but you've got to compare that with the impacts on biodiversity if climate change hits the planet as we think it will. Well, the RSPB has objected to uh, a very, very small proportion of all the wind farm proposals that have come forward. Some of them, developers just haven't put the right amount of work into doing the environmental impact assessments properly. And that's, that's bad business. I mean, uh, bringing forward an environmentally friendly technology, but disregarding the environmental uh, legislation and hurdles you have to go across will... We'll uh, people off this industry. So it's actually a small proportion of wind farms that we've objected to. 
The uh, technical story and commercial story of wind is truly remarkable. Um, the present generation of turbines is, is the last